Hey Church, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so glad and so excited that you've chosen to worship with us. We've just got a really simple program today, a couple songs, kids' message, and we're going to be hearing from one of my good friends, Josh Smithers, who is a pastor out in New Zealand. I'm really excited for the word that he has for us, and I'm really glad that you're here worshiping with us. I hope that you're making uh, use of the new restrictions. I know it's been nice to get out and about. I know I've seen a few of you, I've had dinner with a couple of you, and it's been amazing. And so I hope that you're enjoying this newfound freedom, but I still hope that you're keeping safe, you're still socially distancing, and you're still adhering to the health advice given to us. We're still in this, this isn't over. Um, And so I can't wait till we get to meet again and worship again. But until then, we will keep worshiping this way and we will let you know of the plans that we have in the future. Um, I hope it isn't too much longer, but we'll wait and see. I hope you're keeping well. I hope you're keeping safe. And I hope you're growing in your relationship with Jesus. Let me just pray before we enter into the rest of the service. Jesus, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this time that we get together, that we get to connect um, online and that we get get to connect with your word i just pray over each and every member each and every person watching this service may they walk away differently because they encountered you they were changed by you we thank you for everything you've done everything you're going to do we'll leave it in your hands jesus amen For over 150 years, Adventists all over the world have faithfully returned their tithe each Sabbath. 
Tithe is the number one way that we fund the mission as a church. In the early days of Adventism, the spread of the gospel nearly came to a screeching halt as traveling preachers struggled to put food on the table while continuing to share the Advent message. But now, Tithe supports over 20,000 ministers, plus chaplains, Bible workers, church leaders, and evangelistic projects are funded all over the world. All of this is possible because the Holy Spirit works through us collectively as a people to achieve incredible things in God's name. What you contribute at a local level actually has a global impact. The reality is that when it comes to mission, we are better when we work together. So how does tithing work exactly? For every $100 of tithe that you give, $80 stays right here in Victoria for ministry in our local conference. Of that $80, $52 is used to fund pastors, evangelists, Bible workers and school chaplains. $7 is used to fund our office administration and facilities and the running of our big camp. $14 is used to fund our departmental expenses, which includes ADRA, children and youth ministries, ministries for men and women, and ministries for personal growth and Bible study, plus many other ministries. $5 is used to fund conference-wide evangelistic events and local church evangelism. The final $2 is used to support the cost of Adventist leadership and religious instruction in our schools. The Victorian Conference then passes $20 onto the Australian Union Conference. The Australian Union Conference keeps $8 to fund their ministry leaders, provide national support and resources to conferences and churches, including evangelistic grants and major projects all over Australia. The Australian Union Conference then passes $12 onto the South Pacific Division. The South Pacific Division keeps $10 to fund the support of mission work in new and developing fields, the staffing of leadership of our major institutions and colleges, as well as providing grants for major evangelism projects all over the South Pacific Division. The South Pacific Division then passes the remaining $2 onto the General Conference. The General Conference uses its share to fund the coordination of mission work in new and developing fields all over the world, as well as the leadership that deals with global issues, including public affairs, religious liberty, and biblical research. One tithe can certainly go a long way. When we tithe, we can contribute to what's happening in other parts of Victoria, other parts of Australia, other parts of the South Pacific, and other parts of the world without ever leaving our pew. Through the faithful return of tithe by Adventists all over the world, we are able to have a much bigger impact than if each church was to work individually. When everyone contributes and we share our resources together, we can do great things for God. Because when it comes to mission, we really are better together. Hey church, it's good to see you for another week. Uh, I thought I'd do something a little bit differently this week. I thought I'd interview our guest speaker um, before he presents the word with us. So I have with me another Josh. So Josh, tell us about yourself. Well, just so everyone knows, I am the older Josh. So I was the first Josh out of us, which is very important for everyone to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I'm a, I'm a pastor at Hamilton Church, New Zealand, um, and I've been I've been here at Hamilton for two years, uh, but I've been in ministry for five years. Yeah, and I'd like to let you guys know, like the reason I'm in ministry today is is because of Josh here. Um, we used to catch up once a week for an hour um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about ministry, to talk about life, and. It ended up hanging out all day and we planned out ministry and church things. And because of those conversations, here I am today. So thanks oh, for your influence, Josh. Man, yeah, you influenced me a lot too. Yeah, you guys are very blessed to have Josh uh, Josh with you. And it was just awesome just having a chance to just do do ministry together mm. and do life together and learn and grow together. Um, so yeah, those were really awesome times. Mm. Yeah. Now you said you've been uh, in ministry for five years. Yep. So what do you love about ministry? You know, being a pastor, what is it? that keeps you going yeah um it's a really it's always a very interesting job <laughs> um every day is a bit different and i do love that uh but i think my favorite thing is just when like okay no maybe there are two favorite things 
I love empowering someone and like, you know, mentoring somebody into leading. So like, you know, what we were talking about before with what I was doing with you, Josh, I love doing that, especially seeing like a glimpse of potential in someone and just really sewing into that and seeing how mm. God uses them. That for me has always been a highlight, even before I was a pastor. It's just something I love doing. Um, and the other thing, I guess, is just, um, you know, every now and then get uh, blessed to do Bible studies with people. Um, and so, yeah, I love when I'm doing a study with somebody and there's just that like sort of light bulb moment and they just get it. It clicks and you see mm. something really significant about the Bible, about the story of God or the character of God. And you see it like click. I love that moment. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, no, those are good moments. Um, yep. And I hope to keep experiencing them. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Mm. Now, uh, 2020 has definitely been an interesting year, uh, especially with COVID. Yeah. What has this season, what has this year taught you about life, about ministry, about yourself? Yeah, well, a lot. Um, this has been a huge year for me. Well, I, so I'm married, and um, during the COVID season, we had our first child, a daughter. So she's just turned five months old, which is really awesome. Um, but being in New Zealand, all of our family is still in Australia. So um, yeah, that's been a really hard point of it all. Like we've really had to learn to, um, uh, yeah, I might sound a bit cliche, but really learning to trust God in a new way um, for me. Um, like I don't think I've ever experienced something that had seemed to have so much influence on my world and the world around me that I had so little control over. And for me, it was a really big lesson again in just, you just have to stop. You have to breathe again. You have to be patient. Mm. But ultimately, I just have to trust that, you know, God's got my life in his hands. God's got my family's life in his hand. He loves us and he is leading. And even in something so crazy as like a huge pandemic like this um, that's affecting the whole world, I mean, we were pretty blessed in New Zealand, but even us, like there were massive effects on us too. And even now, like the borders are still closed. So it's like still affecting us in big ways. Um but yeah, th- that's probably the big the big thing for me. It's like patience and trust in hmm. this. Wow, oh, awesome lessons there. Now, yeah. a completely different question off topic from that. What's like the best ever purchase you made and what's like one of the worst purchases you've ever made in your life? <laughs> okay, well, best purchase is really easy. That was the engagement ring for my wife, <laughs> clearly. Nice, dick. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was a big purchase at the time because I was a student and man, it's hard to afford a good engagement ring when you're a student (laughs) so yeah that was that was that um yeah definitely the best best purchase ever um worst purchase ever hard eh um (laughs) probably man probably when i was like an early teenager and i don't know if you remember it but there were these like toy robot things at the time they were super expensive toys And they really pitched it on TV like you'd be like, go get me a drink of water and it'll walk off and get you a drink of water and come back. That's how they really pitched it. And I fell for it 100%. So I bought this thing. It was the most useless piece of technology. It's still at my mom's house now. It is just uh, useless. useless. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It even has a default line in it that says, go get your own drink. Coincidentally enough. So anyway. Um. So yeah, <laughs> that was don't definitely buy, the don't buy purchase. robots. Don't buy robots. Not well, not yet. Maybe when the technology gets better. If Tesla released one, it might be a different story. But this was just some random toy company. Still the worst purchase in my life. Cool. Now, finally, what's a passage in the Bible that's speaking to you um, the most right now? Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, like one 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 passage that's just always been just really big to me, and it's one that I I, I constantly just revisit. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's been a, it's been a really big passage for me, and it's just never really you know when you have a passage and it just doesn't really go away. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so for me, that would definitely have to be. I'm just pulling up the reference now, so make sure I get it right. But then my Bible app's not working. You don't know it off by heart? No, I do, but I wanted to read it, you know, so I could look at it again. <laughs> okay. Exodus 14, 14. Oh, that's a good the one. The Lord will fight for you. You only have mm. to be still. Or in mm. some translations, it might say silent, like from the ESV that I'm reading mm. right now. Um, and for me, it's always just a big, uh, 
yeah, that that and that's really what I was talking about with this season. Like sometimes in when you've got a big battle, our instant response is to just um, is to just go out and to just keep trying to work and work and work and work at it to try and solve and to try and bring it all together. But instead, Exodus fourteen fourteen, it's like in the midst of all of this, in the midst of this Exodus story, which would be a hugely difficult time for these people. Instead, the command is actually, why don't you just wait and let me do the fighting? And I don't think that's our first nature. You know, that's no. so, so not natural to us. Let as me humans. control it. <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. Like, I want to problem solve. I want to plug these holes. I want to, and obviously there is time for that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but it's just a matter of really just saying, hey, you know what? God's got this and he's actually going to do the fighting. When I can't fight anymore, I'm going to be still and let him fight. And even there are going to be times when I'm going to work. But in between those, I'm going to wait for the Lord to lead me to those times instead. Uh, and that's easier said than done, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you for um, yeah, answering those questions. If people want to stay in touch with you, how can we find out more about you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Instagram is probably the way to go. Just at Josh Stuthers. Um, that's where I'm the most active. I do have Facebook, but uh, I don't use it that much. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he never replies to my messages. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's, I don't reply to everyone's messages. So, that's yeah, it's not just you. No, I do. I'm just very, very delayed. You know, like sometimes someone will say, hey, how are you going? And then six months later, I'll say, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> so, that's just, but Instagram, it's a lot more, uh, I don't know. It's just a platform I use a lot more. So, that's sure. Mm-hmm. Head over there. Yeah, awesome. All right. And we'll hear from Josh in his sermon. Really looking forward to it. Um, thank you so much for, for doing this for us. It was my pleasure. Blessings and hope all is going well amidst the crazy lockdown season for you guys. Stories of the Bible. Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is Jesus. hey Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He did many miracles and healed people of their sickness. Oh, hey, everyone! A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. A crowd started to gather around Jesus. There were 5,000 men and many more women and children. Turning to Philip, he asked, Hey, Philip! Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? You see, Jesus was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Um. Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Hey, I got an idea. Then Andrew spoke up, There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. Right, everyone, sit down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and gave them to the people. There you go. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Want some more? I'm all good, thanks. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers, so that nothing is wasted. Here, guy. So they picked up the pieces and filled twelve baskets with scraps, left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves and two fish. Well, hey there, everybody. Uh, My name is Josh. I am the pastor over here in Hamilton, New Zealand of the Hamilton Central Church. Uh, And so it is awesome to be sharing with you today. Um, I don't think I've ever preached at your church or anything before, or uh, I know I've met a number of people from your church. You guys have an awesome community. So um, today it is so awesome to be with you via the power of the internet. And hey, we're praying for you in all the lockdown craziness. It's yeah, really been a hectic season, hasn't it? Um, but hey, what are we like November? We're like midway through past the wound away point. 
less than a month and a half to go of the year. So we're almost to 2021, fam. Um, so really excited. So today I'm gonna to be sharing with you about ceilings and floors. I want you to say that out loud wherever you're watching this, ceilings and floors. What does that have to do with anything? You'll find out. Let's pray before we start. Uh, Jesus, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to dive into your word together. And I pray that today your Holy Spirit would uh, use this video and wherever, however people are watching this, I pray that you would impact their hearts, that Holy Spirit, you would lead them um, to know you deeper, Jesus, that all of us today would leave here differently than we came in because we've had an encounter with you, Jesus. We pray all of this in your holy name and all of us said together, amen. Yes, we did. So... Awesome to be with you today. I remember when I was a teenager and I moved into a we moved into a new house and I remember moving into obviously a different room in the house and I realized I had a bit of a space issue. I didn't have anywhere to put all my things. So I remember telling my dad, my dad, I need a chest of drawers. And so we went to the only place that you go in Melbourne to get a chest of drawers. You know it, where is it? Ikea. Of course we went to Ikea to get a big massive chest of drawers so I could finally have some storage. And my dad, you know, he was a farmer. Um, he was such a handyman, he could build anything. And so we were like, yeah, Ikea should be easy, right? Famous last words, maybe. <laughs> So I ended up getting this chest of drawers coming back. And of course, when you buy something from Ikea, comes in a flat pack, you've got to put it all together. So we made a whole like Sunday of it. And some of you are probably laughing that it took us a whole day, but you know, we took our time. We enjoyed the process <laughs> and we um, got together in my room, started building all these drawers together, had a whole lot of fun. Uh, and then all of a sudden we started getting towards the end and realized there were a couple of problems. There was a whole lot of screws left. There was a particular panel that wasn't working and one of them, we started screwing it in and the whole entire screw just snapped and broke. It was such a weird thing. We didn't have anything to replace it with. And my dad just got fed up. He's like, you know what? Wait right here. Walks out of the room. And I'm like, oh, dad, like I can't build this by myself. Comes back in with, of course, his drill. And he's just like, let me fix this. These guys don't know what they're doing. Gets it all together. And just drills this whole thing together. It is the most st sturdy chest of drawers you will ever see. Because my dad just took it into his own hands. It was so fun. And I don't know, maybe some of you have had a similar experience uh, with some products that the instruction manual, it just doesn't, it just doesn't do the job. Sometimes you just got to take it into your own hands. My dad's the kind of guy who could do that. Me, absolutely not. I'm, I need to use the instruction manuals. I do not have that ability. Maybe one day God will bless me with those skills. What does this have to do with today's message? A little bit. <laughs> it's a fun experience to build something with your family. It's a fun experience to build something like a father and a son building something together, a mother and a daughter. I'm sure they have the same sort of thing. Um, and you know, in, in the Bible, we have this story of a father wanting to build something wanting to have his son involved, but the father could not build it. So he did the next best thing he could. Some of you might already know what story I'm referring to. Let's turn that together. If you have your Bibles, your phones, laptops, whatever, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 1 right through to 19. So 1 Chronicles chapter 22 from verse 1 through to 19. We're going to read the whole thing. That's going to be our key text for today that I want you to focus on uh, and spend some time studying for yourself as well so you can read it and let this seed that goes into you, let it grow and, and harvest into whatever uh, the Lord wants to lead um, you to understand with this. So let's check it out. Then David said, There shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offering for Israel. David commanded to gather together the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he sent uh, he set stone cutters to prepare dressed stones for building the house of God. David also provided great quantities of iron for nails for the doors of the gates and for the clamps, as well as the bronze in quantities beyond weighing. That's a lot of bronze. And cedar timbers without number. There was so much timber they couldn't even count it. Uh, and so for the Sidonians and Ty Tyrians, I'm probably pronouncing those wrong, sorry, uh, brought great quantities of cedar to David. 
For David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent. I love that idea that they know that this is for God, so they know that this thing, to even be a glimmer of how great our God is, this building needs to be exceedingly magnificent. So cool. Of fame and glory throughout all the lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord and the God of Israel. And David said this to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, You have shed too much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before me on earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest in all of his surrounding enemies, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give him peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever." Let's continue on. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God. He, um, as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding that when he gives you charge over Israel, you may keep the law of the, um, of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and the rules that the Lord commanded Moses uh, for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Man, that is repeated so often in the Old Testament, that be strong and courageous. It's such an amazing statement when you start comparing all the places uh, that it is, um, that it's repeated. Fear not and do not be dismayed. With great pains, I have provided for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold. That's a lot of gold. A million talents of silver. That's a lot of silver. And bronze and iron beyond weighing. They didn't have a way to weigh them because it was so much. It's crazy. For there is so much of it. Timber and stone too I have provided. But to these you must add. You have an abundance of workmen, stonecutters, masons, carpenters, and all kinds of craftsmen without number, skilled in working, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Arise and work. The Lord be with you. All right, two verses to go. Uh, Three, sorry. (laughs) Uh, The Lord also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not given you peace on every side? For he has delivered the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and his people. Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God, so that the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God may be brought into the house built for the name of the Lord. Wow, that's a lot that we looked at. Uh, Look, really... There are some key parts of this. And I, again, I would encourage you to read. There's so much here that you could look at and study. Um, but really, the, the, the key of the story is this. David, we know him as being a man after God's own heart. He was passionate about the Lord. And what he wanted was instead of God being in a tent, he wanted there to be a proper house of the Lord, something that would speak to all the nations. People would see it and be like, that is amazing. Look at that place. It is magnificent. The God that they are worshiping from within there must be even greater than that. He was passionate about this. But because he had shed so much blood and there'd been so much warfare in his life, essentially God didn't want this temple to be a temple that was built from the, the, the hands of a man who'd shed this much blood. And that must have hurt David. That must have been hard to hear because he was so passionate about this. But instead, God tells him, well, you're going to have a son and you're going to get your son ready to do this. So how cool is that? He put all of this in place so that Solomon could build the dream that David had. Now, it could have been easy for David to become, you know, selfish about this and be like, well, if I can't build the temple, no one gets to build the temple. I think we can be like that sometimes if we're honest. (laughs) And sometimes we can have a bit of a struggle that if we don't get to do it, I don't ever want it to happen. But instead, David cast all of that aside and he wanted the best for the next generation which is what this is all about. The way I would word this is that David wanted the ceiling of his generation to be the floor of the next. 
And that's what I want too in my life, that I want whatever the best I can achieve is, whatever the best I can get is, I want that to just be the floor for the next generation. Whatever my ceiling is, I want that to be their floor, their base, their starting note. And imagine if every generation started thinking like that, imagine how amazing, uh, amazing we could see the church progress, imagine how amazingly we could see society progress. Uh, but often we can get, we can think things are just all about us and our generation. But instead, we put our minds to, well, hey, what does God want to do next with the next generation to come? So what are the best practices for setting up the next generation? Well, today I want to share with you three. This is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just three things that I noted from this story that we can do to build up the next generation. And these are things you can start doing right now because the next generation is already here. They're already a part of our church. They're not coming later. They're already here now. And what we can start doing right now is doing things to build them up so that they have the best shot at what's to come next. And this is what's exciting to me about our church is that we are so passionate about young people. We're so passionate about them rising up and taking the gospel further than we could ever imagined it, doing things that we could never have imagined in our church because they're just going to go so much further than what we could because we're setting them up for that. We want our ceilings to be the next generation's floor. So what are the three practices that I'm going to share today. Well, let's get a start on, right? Encourage and pray for them. That's the first one. Encourage and pray for them. A really great quote I wanted to share with you. Good men plant trees that they know that they will never get shelter from. How cool is that? Good men plant trees they know they will never get shelter from. It is planting something for the next generation. I remember reading a, um, a finance book a while ago, Barefoot Investor. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It's so popular in Australia. Um, but I remember he, he talked about when his farm burnt down and the first thing he did is he went out and he planted an apple tree, which seems like a really strange thing to do. But I remember uh, when the author was talking about this, he was saying, look, I'm not going to be able to hand over the same farm that I could have before, but at least if I plant an apple tree now, the next generation will get to enjoy its fruits. So he knew he was never going to get to enjoy the fruits of that apple tree, but the next generation would. And imagine if all of us had that mindset, I'm going to plant this tree now, not necessarily for my benefit, but for the benefit of those to come. So exciting. Okay, so first thing, encourage and pray for them. Encourage and pray for the next generation. So I love, um, you know, there is whole book of the Bible, uh, two books of the Bible, first and second Timothy. It's all this. It's Paul encouraging Timothy. Uh, And I love if you check out second Timothy chapter one, verses six to eight. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So he laid hands and prayed for him because he knew how amazing the plans were that God had for Timothy. So for the spirit of God does not uh, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Um, or of me as a prisoner, rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Wow. So it's like, you've got these gifts, Timothy. You've got all of these things in you. Fan it into flame. Don't just rest. So this is amazing and prayer and encouraging Timothy in all of this. Even though Paul was in such a hard place being a prisoner, he was encouraging Timothy relentlessly. And in that First Chronicles chapter 22, verses 11 to 13, this is, uh, if, you, yeah, if you go back to our, our key text, Now, my son, the Lord be with you so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord, your God, as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding when he gives you charge over Israel, that you may keep the law of your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes of the rules and the Lord commanded for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Those words. Fear not. Do not be dismayed. So he's incredibly encouraging to his son here. That fear not, do not be dismayed, push on. And I know for me, when I was growing up and I was getting involved in church and, you know, even when I was like first starting out in ministry and I was doing my internship, I made a lot of mistakes, believe it or not. (laughs) I made a bunch of mistakes, did a whole lot of wrong, preached really average sermons sometimes, did, had awkward encounters, all these kind of things. It's like, oh man, I feel, you feel so bad at your job, but... 
I remember like, cause you're just starting out, you're just getting experience, you're getting a feel for what it means to be a pastor. And I remember just, there was one day and I was so discouraged with myself over here in New Zealand. I just thought, man, I should just quit and just head back to Australia. I can't, I'm not good enough to do this. I'm just making so many mistakes. I'm not like, I saw all these other amazing pastors around and we have so many amazing pastors who work for our church globally. Um, And I was like, I'm never going to be like that. But I remember just getting, you know, talking to my mentor and just saying I was struggling. And he just said, hey, this is your first year. This is the time to make mistakes. You're doing a great job. And he just gave me so much encouragement and prayed for me. I remember getting messages from from friends just randomly out of the blue, just, um, out of the blue, just saying, hey, I'm praying for you. I hope everything's going well. And that was so amazing to me. So I want you to think about today, who is somebody young that you can be encouraging? Who's somebody young that you can be praying for? Even if you don't have that much of a relationship, you can pray for anyone. If there are some young people in your church or in your um, in your community who you could just, you know what, I just want to start praying for that one. I really see God wants to do something in their life. I'm just going to start praying for them. And who knows, you know, and just letting them know, hey, I'm just praying for you, can be huge and life-changing for people. The second thing you can do Uh, for the next generation. So the first, empower and pray for them. The second, financially build for them. Whoa, he's talking about finances. We don't like when pastors talk about finances. I'm talking about finances because this is huge. This is a massive part about setting up the next generation um, for a win, you know, to be able to set them up, to be able to go and share the gospel even more effectively than we could have dreamed or imagined. If we can financially uh, set the path for them to go, imagine, imagine what they could do. And, uh, you know, we see in First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 14, and this is a huge part of what David did with great pains. So it actually cost him. It was hard for him. This is a lot of money, even for a king. With great pains, I have provided you for the house of the Lord, a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver and bronze and iron beyond weighing. For there is so much of it, timber and stone too, I've provided to these you must add. So he was saying, I'm going to do my best to set you up financially for this. This is a huge task, Solomon. This is a massive thing you've got to do, but I'm going to do my best to set you up with everything you can. You've still got to add to it, but let me give you the best head start I can. Now, incredibly, um, you know, I know in our church, we all are sitting amongst pews that most of us here didn't build. This was built by somebody else. This roof above us was paid for and built by somebody else. But we get to come in and worship here. We don't have to worry about finding and building a building. Instead, we get to say, okay, what does God want from us next? Because somebody else financially built up for us. This is that proverb again, you know, (laughs) it's that that's when a society grows, when old men, all women plant trees that they know that they'll never get the shade of because they know that it's more important for these trees to exist. It's more important for us to have these churches. It's more important for us to have these structures. It's more important for us to have these things together, not so that I can benefit from them, but so that the next generation can go further than what we could ever imagine. That is so exciting to me. And we see that so clearly with David and Solomon. And I wonder what God is calling us to next. It is incredible, you know, stepping into the the world of Adventism and seeing how much like how much infrastructure and how many things are built around us to just step into. The fact that we can just come in here and there is already Adra doing incredible things all across the world. And we just get to step in and say, wow, this thing's already up and going. We can just tap into it. We can just see see the fruits of it. We can contribute to it. We can help them grow to do whatever's next. It's incredible to see. And, you know, maybe even for your church, you've had, I know um, you guys have had some amazing video ministry stuff going on. I don't know who paid for that. I don't know who made all that happen. But... It's incredible how many people are going to be benefiting from these videos. And we don't even know how long people will be benefiting from these videos. Who knows? But the reality is if we're willing to sow, you know, for me and my finances, I think about, I think about investments. It's a big thing. I'm not some like mastermind shareholder, investor, whatever. (laughs) But I think about, well, where do I want my money to go? What's like the greatest investment I can have? And ultimately, I can't think of a better investment. I can't think of a better way to ultimately be sowing the the seeds of my money than into the kingdom of God, because that's the kingdom that's going to last forever. Amen. Amen. And incredibly, um, you know, 
these days we, we see it all across the news. We have a whole lot of people who are both figur- figuratively and I guess literally cutting down the trees that next generation needs to survive, cutting away things that the next generation needs. So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to stand? For, are we going to stand for that? You think about Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate picture of sacrificial love. He sacrificed everything for us. And not just for a specific generation. Jesus' sacrifice was for all generations. It's incredible. And this sort of picture of sacrificial love, this is what changes the world. This is for me is probably the most compelling thing about Jesus is this the ultimate picture of sacrificial love. Willing to do things that you, you're not necessarily going to be- be- benefit from, but it's just because you, you want to give that much love to somebody else. That's amazing. So imagine if we had a whole churches who were just so passionate about this same kind of sacrificial love. Okay, encourage and pray for them. The second was financially build for them. Thirdly, strategically plan for them. Strategically plan for them. We don't need to force the next generation to go through the same problems our generations went through. Just because we did it, now they have to. Uh, <laughs> I remember um, I remember talking to somebody. This is a, a particular uh, part of the process in becoming a pastor with, with Avondale. And I remember asking, why, why are we doing this? Um, why are we doing this particular part of the course? It just seems like we don't need to do this now because of the way the world is. And the answer, I mean, it was a bit tongue in cheek, the answer, but I think there was some truth to, truth to it. They said, well, we had to do it. So now you have to do it. <laughs> what that was the only reason this part is still here i mean it was a lecture again i think it was a bit tongue-in-cheek and funnily enough that part of the course doesn't doesn't function the same anymore and it's updated for today but i think a lot of us go through these sort of things i know some people when they step into new jobs there's these sort of all these hoops they have to jump through and when they ask about why do i have to do these things often the answer is just this is how it is this is what we, we all had to do so now you have to do it too but imagine if we could think better than that. If Imagine if we could think, well, rather than have unnecessary hoops that the next generation has to jump through, what if we could strategically plan for them to have the easiest way through possible? The most streamlined and most effective ways possible for them to come in, be a part of the church, to grow, to lead, to share the gospel, to give them all the resources they need to share the gospel with their friends, with their communities. Imagine what could happen. And I love 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. You have an abundance of workmen, stonecutters, masons, carpenters, and all kinds of craftsmen without number, skilled in working, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Arise and work. The Lord be with you. David also commanded the leaders of Israel to help Solomon, his son. So David actually provided all these resources, but he also put systems and workers in place around his son coming through. He had a, a commanded leaders to be around. So he strategically planned for Solomon to be able to do this as best as he could. And this is incredible. When we start planning and, you know, like actually talking to the next generation about what can we do to best plan now? And I think about how many people did that for me growing up. I remember, uh, and some of you might remember, we because we, uh, I'm actually from Melbourne originally. And... Uh, I went to Heritage College and for a while we had a Friday night teen church there, which was awesome. And um, it was a great place for us to learn how to do church together as teenagers. Uh, And so what we would do is my mum, who was the pastor and chaplain at the time, she said, okay, Friday nights, this is, this is yours. I want to empower you and give you everything I can to make sure you guys have every opportunity to do ministry to your friends in a way that makes sense to you. So we said, okay, we don't know what we're doing. Um, and she said, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll plan everything out for you. I'll make sure you've got food and a guest speaker and a room to use. And you guys do the rest. We're like, okay, we'll give it a go. And it was, it was a mess. The first few, I don't know if anybody here was at those first few gospel nights, nights <laughs> that we did. Um, but it was bizarre. We didn't realize, we kind of forgot that you could actually separate song sets. So we did like six songs, all the very beginning of the at, at the program and then something weird, I don't remember, and then the guest speaker and that was it. That was the end. There was nothing to finish. It was just awkward. And then eventually somebody was like, oh, maybe we should do a song at the end. We we're like, great idea, great idea. You know, all these things and we uh, tweaked it and all these things. But basically somebody had set up an infrastructure around us so that we could learn, we could grow. Yeah, we made mistakes. Yeah, we 
ran some pretty average programs, but eventually by the end of the year, we really understood how to run and be a part of a church so that later on we could take those skills and take them to our home churches as well. And that's the thing. When we can strategically plan and make plans in place that are godly, that are spirit-led, I just think there can be amazing things that could happen. I think back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And when it was the fall of men, right when we made our biggest mistake, um, right when Adam and Eve ate the fruit and all this sort of thing. And then when God was being real with them and saying, well, here's the consequence of this whole thing. He makes this promise. He says this, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What does this have to do with it? Right from the outset, of our sin problem that we're dealing with, right from the outset of our fall, God made a strategic plan for us. He strategically planned and knew right from the beginning, okay, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to step in. I'm going to send my son, Jesus, to die in their place for the mistakes that they've made, for the sins that they have, for their shame, so that they can be fully reconciled, so that we can be together again. And we see that plan play out right through to the end of Revelation, where we see eventually we get to be with God again, fully just like he planned, because of that plan that he put in place for Jesus to be our, our substitute and our sacrifice on that cross. It's so powerful. But that's how much God loves us, that he would do all of that just for us. Now, if that same love lives in us, what are we doing for those who are to come after us, for those that we see right now, for those that we can mentor? And you know, this isn't even necessarily an age thing. It can even just be the newer Christians coming to the faith, those who are new, what can I be doing for them? Whatever it is, who can you be praying for? So if we go back through, encourage and pray for them, financially build for them, strategically plan for them. Who can you be encouraging and praying for right now in your church community? Who can you be, what can you be doing to financially build for them? And you know what, if you're not in a place where financial building is viable for you right now, I know these are really tough times. Hey, what can you be praying over? What kind of financial positions can you be praying over right now that God would continue to bless and lead them? And lastly, what strategic plans are we making as churches? to best streamline the process? How can we best put systems and things and people in place so that this next generation can come through, take the baton and run with the gospel as fast as they can to all corners of the earth? What are we doing? So I pray that you're encouraged by this message today, church. Let me pray for you. And we'll finish it there. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that you encourage us and you're speaking into our lives lord we thank you that you provide for us lord we thank you that you have amazing plans for us and so lord may we take these things and may we invest in the next generations in whatever we can that lord whatever our ceiling is whatever the furthest we can get lord we pray that the next generation can go further because we've set things in place for them may we not have a spirit of jealousy or, or, or anything like that. But Lord, may we just have a spirit of grace. May we just have openness in our heart to where you want to lead. Lord, we want to see as many people come to know you, Jesus, come to serve you, come to listen and obey your truths, Lord, to live the life that you've called us to. We want to see as many people do that as, as, as possible. And Jesus, we're excited about that day that you come again. So Lord, I just pray that you would bless this message, Lord, that it would go deep into the hearts of people and it would grow. We pray all of this in holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, church. Pray that you have a great Sabbath and a great week ahead. And hey, blessings for all that's ahead. Thank you.
Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you were blessed by this program. I hope that you got something out of the message. And if you did, hey, leave a comment. Send Josh a message, send me a message, and I'll pass it on to him. Um, but we are so glad that you joined us. I hope that you have an amazing week. Let's stay in touch via um, the internet, email, phone, Facebook. Hey, we're there. Um, stay safe, stay well, take care.